Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find our entire back catalog there, uh, as well as links to Jeff's blog and our Twitter accounts and other ways you can get a hold of us. So send us show recommendations or any other comments you could possibly have. Also, um, we are into supercomputer season, so my Jeff and myself will be there, and um, Jeff is also on the line. Jeff, thanks a lot for your time. Hey, Brock. Yeah, today, actually, I think we should mention this is going to be after the fact, but it's a special spooky edition of, of RCE Cast because we're recording on Halloween. I mean, this won't go live till after the fact, but, but just know that there are ghosts and goblins floating around as we are recording. Yes, it is the holiday season. Actually, on the way down to where I record this, I ran into the dean of our College of Engineering here at the University of Michigan, and he was dressed up as a gigantic ear of corn. Outstanding. Yes. Because when I think Michigan, I think corn. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. right. So our uh, guest today, um, I'll give her an opportunity to introduce herself, but uh, she is Boyana Norris. Um, Boyana, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself? Um, thank you. Uh, yes, so my name is Boyana Norris. Um, I am a faculty member at the Computer and Information Science Department at the University of Oregon. Um, I'm very fresh here. I just joined after 13 years um, as a research scientist at the Math and Computer Science Division at Argonne National Lab um, near Chicago. Cool. And we are going to be talking to Boyana about her project today called Oreo. Now, I wonder if you could tell us what Oreo is and how you got the name. Because when I search for Oreo, I find the obvious cookie references. And I also find that Google helpfully tells me that it's a city in Spain. So what is your definition of Oreo? So, so I didn't know about the city in Spain. Uh, but when we were looking for a name for our new um, uh, research project, uh, we wanted something that had to do with performance. And so we searched a lot of languages and dictionaries online and Finally, a very obscure word um, um, in Greek contains Oreo as part of that word, and it's the word for speed limit. I can't pronounce the whole thing. And because it also sounds like the cookie, we thought that would be a very good idea uh, for a new tool name. So, uh, But it is spelled O-R-I-O. So um, what exactly is Oreo? What's the, what's the elevator pitch? Um, Oreo uh, basically is a framework that uh, allows people to do um, a couple of different things. So you can uh, both define uh, new experimental little languages um, to express some computation uh, that may be, you know, in your specific domain. Um, so you could, um, instead of uh, starting with CC++, you can come up with new representations of your problem. So it allows you to do that. Um, and also, um, assuming you don't want to define a new language, it also lets you um, generate code uh, that's optimized for different architectures. Uh, and what we do is we try to uh, target most of the um, architectures that are of interest to high-performance computing. Uh, including, you know, CPUs, uh, multi-core CPUs, uh, GPUs, um, and some some new things we're working on. Uh, also, with uh, many cores and FPGAs, uh, they're not ready yet. But you know, we always try to think of new new code targets. Uh, so you you could use it in several different ways, but typically people use it to uh, optimize the performance for a particular architecture. Now, how did you get started on this? Because that sounds like a pretty pretty wide-scale project. I mean, it, it fits under the lumping of performance optimization and performance improvement, but you, you touched on a lot of different things there. How did this get started as a project? Yeah, it, it um, actually, it was inspired. Um, it, it started out of sheer frustration. Um, so <laughs> uh, Bill Grapp, um, who is currently a Thomas Siebel Chair in Computer Science at UIUC, he, um, in, uh, back at Argonne, when he was um, uh, working with me in 2006, expressed the desire uh, to, to come up with a way to, ex to specify um, different optimizations uh, that you could do on your own code. So suppose you implemented something in C, um, you, you write your loops and you know exactly how they could be optimized, well, and the compiler doesn't do it, right? Um, uh, for some reason, and uh, he wanted to actually be able to explicitly force uh, certain optimizations. So that was the first um, goal <laughs> we had was to express 
what can be done on a piece of code uh, in a way that lets us automate it. Uh, and uh, so it was not very complicated. I mean, it was basically here, um, unroll these loops um, or do a few other things that compilers typically should be able to do, but maybe don't. I should point out, uh, we've actually had uh, Dr. Grapp on the show before, and he's a friend of the show. So that, that's it's kind of cool we're going full circle on this. So define your own language. What would you see as the benefit as of telling a graduate student or a researcher to go define your own language, which we will then turn into something that a compiler can turn into machine code? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, what the... Current languages people use mostly um, for their um, HPC projects, which is usually C, C++, Fortran. Um, I mean, they, they definitely uh, allow you to express all your computations, obviously. But sometimes in order to optimize something more fully, um, if you knew, for example, that you're working with matrices, you could actually em employ what you learned in linear algebra. Um, and perform some matrix transformations before you have loops. Um, so that's one um, high-level example of where you may want to give the compiler or the tool some extra information about the objects you're working with. And this is where, you know, in different domains, uh, you may not have a matrix, but you may have some other uh, higher-level description of what it is you're doing that could potentially enable some transformations that aren't uh, possible um, at the level of C or Fortran. So then, our like, what's what do we define the language in? Is it like a normal parser generator? Or right. Not if I'm using the right word. Does it have its own, or is it something we've all seen before, or something like that? Um, well, okay. So, so there's a, a couple of choices. So, Oreo already uh, has a, a few. Um, so it has a. It doesn't have to be really a domain language. So it already supports a few types of inputs, right? Um, but if you wanted to add a new one. Uh, yes, you have to write your own little parser, um, and uh, one of the philosophies behind the tool was to to have as little baggage as possible, <laughs> you know. So it's actually all in Python, and we use the ply uh, parser generator um, tool, and so it's actually fairly trivial to define your parser. You do have to know how to do that, um, and so uh, the reason it's a little bit easier um, than some real compiler projects is is exactly that we're sticking to Python and very very simple tools uh, for expressing your syntax and implementing the parser. So that's actually you you kind of uh, hit on my exact upcoming question here was how does this compare to something like the Clang compiler which you know prides itself in being able to you can put all kinds of hooks all over the place um, and do all kinds of transformation of the once the, the, the software has been parsed and so on, and you can directly manipulate the data structures for the emitted code and things like that. How does this compare? Uh, this is, um, so this, this framework is a lot uh, simpler and a lot more open. Um, and so you could basically put your own modules um, at any um, uh, point. So like we mentioned, you can do your new language, for example, which if you take a, a, a project like Clang, um, they limit their input languages, right, to, to say, C and C++. Um, and so we let people um, specify new syntax more easily, I think. <laughs> now, that could be a pretty subjective opinion, but um, then, then if you were using a real compiler toolkit. Um, that is not to say that you couldn't do it, um, you know, in one of those larger infrastructures, but we believe that enabling rapid prototyping here is the... Um, you know, one of the main goals um, so that you can make a decision whether pursuing um, a certain type of language or a certain type of transformation is really worth your time. So get results quickly um, uh, in order to decide whether what you're thinking um, actually makes sense. So Jeff mentioned Clang, but we also had on the show um, the Chapel language from Cray, and they are like this intermediate language compile or run a parser to generate then, you know, I, th I think they were using C or C++ to then feed to a traditional compiler. Is there any projects like that that are like an abstract, scientific-specific language that's using Oreo? 
Uh, well, no, so there's a big difference between the full language approaches like Chapel um, and what we're trying to do with Oreo. Um, in, a, in, a, in a language, um, if, if you say here's a, this amazing new language, and I really like Chapel, by the way, <laughs> um, uh, what you, if you're a developer, right, you're, you now have to make a decision. Um, do I just rewrite, uh, do I rewrite all my code right now in Chapel? Um, and, and so how, how are you going to decide whether that is really uh, something you should do or not? So what Aria lets you do is um, not rewrite your whole code. Um, what you do is you generate um, very small, uh, you replace small pieces of your code with something that was generated from a different language potentially. Um, so, so it's a different approach and it lets you uh, hook up the resulting code uh, to the rest of your application that you've already uh, implemented in, in some legacy language, which I don't believe you can do with um, Chapel at the moment. Okay, so going back just a little bit here, it, it sounds like Oreo is is a tool that you invoke to generate code that you then compile with a, an actual compiler. But yep. it sounds like there's a lot of intelligence and smarts in, in in what it actually generates. And so is this static analysis of code or does it do any dynamic analysis or, or how does it determine, you know, like, oh, I see this code and this is how I will make it better. Give us a little insight into what kind of things you do. Um, yeah, actually, uh, it's, it's nice you bring that up because it's actually pretty, um, it's a pretty dumb approach at the moment. It, it's not very smart in that it will attempt uh, many, many, many optimizations. So uh, basically the way it works is it will apply, uh, so it knows about certain things that it can optimize. Um, so for loops, it would apply typical compiler loop transformations. And uh, then it employs um, uh, search to determine what version um, should be kept, what is the best performing version. And if you did that um, on a even not a very complicated piece of code, if you have a lot of transformations that can result in uh, really exponentially many versions, right? Um, so part of the smarts are actually not so much in being clever about how you optimize the code because um, you just consider all optimizations. Um, uh, so the smarts are mainly in how you search that space. And so there are some numerical optimization algorithms implemented in Oreo that help you explore the space without having to test each and every um, code variant that we generate. Now, what level do you uh, search for optimizations? Is it just at the the block level, the loop level, or do you do cross-functional analysis? How how deep does it go? Uh, it is not cross-functional yet, although we are thinking about this. So, um, if you're talking about input at the level of uh, C loops, for example, right? Um, then, really, uh, this is. Portions of functions is what you're um, typically thinking of. However, when you start talking about um, domain languages that express something at a higher level, and MATLAB is a good example because most people know it. Um, so if you had your input in MATLAB, you could express some pretty complicated um, linear algebra computations with just a few lines of um, matrix operations, right? And so that can result in uh, potentially complicated implementations and the analysis uh, to generate them is pretty extensive, but we don't actually analyze any sort of, um, uh, we, we don't have multiple functions as input. We have a very simple high level um, computation specification, but the code that results from it may be complex. So. You've been talking about like optimizations for passing to a compiler, but you also talk about domain-specific languages. I could think of this enabling a researcher to make a language that lets them develop something faster. Like you said, the MATLAB thing, where you can, in three lines, do some what would, if you had to write that in C, would be very complex because you'd have to manually loop and everything else. So is the focus mostly hardware performance, or is the focus maybe application developer performance in terms of the amount of time they have to think? Um, it's actually both. Um, and maybe I'm too, uh, I, I, I don't know if I'm too idealistic about this, but I believe you can do both at the same time. And um, 
I believe that, um, and it's pretty justified actually when you think of it, because if you um, if you give um, enough information to a tool to perform uh, more code transformations, I mean that's great. Um, so if you encode things in very low level um, C sequential semantics, um, it's very hard, for example, to parallelize, right? Uh, but if you wrote it in a way that allows us to uh, decide uh, how it can be parallelized better, that would result both in you taking less time to write it and, um, you know, ultimately achieving much better performance on the on the target architecture. Um, so I think it really it's it's aimed at both. Um, so you go at it from both directions. So I'm going to circle back just a second. I, I realized I should have asked you this question before. Uh, you have this big database of all these optimizations and whatnot. Where do you get all those from? Uh, many of them are really directly out of what compilers already do. Um, so we're not reinventing the wheel there. Um, there are reasons why compilers don't apply them to a certain piece of code. And so uh, this is just a way uh, to remedy that. Um, and yes, you do rewrite your computation somewhat. Um, potentially to, to be able to enable that. Um, and others, uh, we just think about it, you know, and, and we try to, to figure out, okay, how, how could this be optimized? So it's, it's, some of it is just research the usual thinking process of here's a problem, uh, what types of optimizations can you do? And others are just taking um, everything that compilers do today and being able to uh, basically enforce it. Now, why, why do, going back actually all the way to the very beginning, why don't compilers do this? If, this is, if these are things that compilers know how to do, why don't they do them? <laughs> I guess. Um, it's, a, it's not the compiler's fault. <laughs> uh, so it's basically, uh, it's the language's fault mainly. Um, you, when you're a compiler, you know, and you have this very uh, complex um, uh, you know, control and data flow situation, you, you have to be conservative in your analysis in order to ensure that you, you can generate correct code. And, or you cheat uh, in a way by not doing this kind of global analysis at all. Uh, <laughs> so it focuses on relatively simple portions of the code. Um, and it's true that you can achieve uh, some similar effects with some compilers. You can uh, guide them with pragmas if they support such right and and achieve uh, to an extent um, similar results for a small portion of the code so um, it's basically it's it's really hard to have accurate um, program analysis um, that of course that's a prerequisite for being able to optimize the code so let's talk a little bit about the things that um, it kind of looks at and supports right now does it take any consideration of the type of hardware you're on and like I should be rewriting this to make it pad my data structure so that the compiler auto vectorizes it for AVX or something like that? Uh, right. So what we, um, well, that's what you have to do if you're using a, a standard compiler and our philosophy is to never ever have you do that. Um, <laughs> so you should write your code um, in the simplest way possible um, and we will, uh, the tool is going to explore the optimizations. So whether you do padding or not uh, might be one of them. Um, and so that's kind of the goal here is to have a simple non-architecture specific input and um, then be able to generate the optimizations from that. So then do you have like a hardware database? Like can I have my simple code that is the simplest way of describing what I'm trying to solve? And on platform A, it does, say, 32 byte alignment, but on platform B, it now does the new 64 byte alignment. Um, yeah, in a way, uh, when you do the process of um, optimization, which is also known as auto tuning, um, you generate all these different versions, you will experimentally arrive at that um, data. We don't actually store it right now. Um, what you do is. Uh, you do get that information, uh, we just don't reuse it. And we're actually working at the moment in being smarter about that. So suppose you've tuned some kind of, uh, some piece of code in a given architecture, 
and uh, you then later tune a similar code on the same architecture, it's possible to take advantage of the fact that you already know um, uh, what potentially uh, good optimizations are. Um, but at the moment, we don't. You just do it all over from scratch. So is this kind of like a, an out-of-band, like PGO profile-guided optimization? Like kind um, yeah, of? You, you could. You, it's it, it will be profile guided. Right now, it's just basically um, more of a, uh, you know, uh, it does not take advantage of past results, but we are working actually on, on enabling that. Um, and the, the result, the outcome of that will be not that you'll be able to get uh, better code uh, necessarily, but you would be able to get it faster. Now, you mentioned earlier, too, about uh, using... Uh, particularly when you have your own domain-specific language of, of some high-level concept that can be paralyzed under the covers. Um, how, what kind of parameters do you accept uh, for that? For example, and, and again, I'm going to touch on hardware again like, like Brock just did, but let's say I have some high-level operation like a matrix multiply or something like that, and I don't want to paralyze it for a specific platform. Do you understand things like uh, MPI or threads and how wide do you want the parallelization to be? How, how does that work? Um, currently, we are mostly at the thread level. And, of course, GPUs are also um, kind of parallelization um, happens there. But um, we have started thinking about MPI. It's a much more complicated issue, obviously. Um, so I would say yes uh, for threading um, and for GPU style architectures. Um, not yet for MPI, and the way you express it is not any different. That's the goal. I don't think for MPI that can um, remain as simple, and that's part of our struggle there is how how do you describe your problem in a way that makes it MPI parallelizable? We haven't cracked that. We may not be able to do it, but, you know, we are thinking about it. All right, along those lines, with threads and whatnot, since everything today is NUMA, uh, do you pay attention to any of those effects? Do you care about processor or memory affinity and these kinds of things? Um, not uh, So not explicitly, uh, but implicitly, yes, because uh, most of the, for example, tiling optimizations for um, uh, loop-based computations end up, um, you know, being target, they, they end up targeting the memory hierarchy and, and uh what happens is that you are going to address these issues. Um, we can't control it necessarily directly. Um, I mean, for some architectures you can, but not for all. Uh, but given that we're doing empirical tuning, um, you know, you will uh, generate possibly close to the best variant uh, by doing these optimizations that take into account all of these uh, parameters. So if we want to use our own domain-specific language, we'd have to write our own parser. But what language is out of the box? Like if I have an existing Fortran C, C++, does Oreo understand that? And I can just feed it in there and it's going to give me back what it thinks an optimized rewrite of that code would be? Uh, so there are actually other projects uh, that try to do that. The Chill project that the University of uh, Utah um, can accept C and I believe Fortran input. And we, on purpose, don't want to do that with Oreo because, um, in reality, most of the implementations um, are not ready for optimization. So we do actually want people to rewrite them. And so far, the most versatile way of uh, doing it has been to have people rewrite them using uh, syntax that uh, is basically a subset of C. And so C with restrictions, uh, we call it a loop language. So it looks very similar to what you started with, most likely, but it, it just makes it um, completely clear to the, optimi to the transformation um, engine uh, that certain things are possible. Uh, so yeah, rewrite is always uh, required because um, Oreo at the moment ignores the original code uh, completely now. We have started um, uh, planning some more um, uh, automated way of getting that uh, input to Oreo. So basically looking at your existing code, 
uh, with some of the traditional compiler tools. I have a long experience with the ROSE compiler toolkit, so that's my usual go-to tool. Uh, but basically be able to parse your original code and be able to extract the parts that Oreo should be focusing on. So when you say restrictions, what kind of restrictions are we talking about here? Anything that a scientific programmer would care about or not? Mm, usually not. Um, I'm hoping not. Um, so far, it's been possible to do pretty much everything we've looked at um, that comes primarily out of scientific applications. Um, so the really uh, the time-consuming portions of many scientific applications are not very complex. I mean, they're not really, uh, you know, in terms of code complexity. So, sorry, it just seems like that Silk or uh, Oreo is touches a lot of different things. So, uh, Silk Plus, the the Silk syntax for kind of describing that this is you know, an array instead of looping over it. Would any type of syntax like that benefit Oreo to have it more aware of the actual structure of data and where it could parallelize it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And um, and I think that's something we want to pursue much more actively in the future. Right now, uh, you know, we've looked at, um, we've integrated it with the MATLAB-like language that uh, built to order compiler um, at University of Colorado um, has, and we've implemented a simple language for um, finite difference uh, type computations on structured grids. Uh, but really, uh, you know, the more, um, so, so something that's at the array level would also be, I think, helpful. Um, if, unless uh, you introduce some really complex indexing and, and such things. So um, the answer is definitely yes. Um, so I'm sorry, just to, to – could you give us a, a concrete example of one of these restrictions? Like, for example, do you say no aliasing? Because I know, for example, that's one of the things that Fortran language uses uh, to enable their compilers to optimize highly and things like that. Right. So so the conventions are uh, no aliasing. Um, we are uh, thinking of allowing some aliasing, but you have to explicitly say what it is. Uh, but at the moment, no aliasing. <laughs> So we can assume that for the input, which helps a lot, um, obviously. Um, some of the index expressions when you're indexing arrays, um, you, you can't really use uh, arbitrary types of index expressions, so the, there are limits to that. Um, and now C++, um, you know, if, if you get really complicated uh, user-defined types, I mean, we, we obviously can't handle those as inputs, so there has to be some sort of translation between um, what you're really doing in terms of floating point computations and what uh, and how your data may be organized um, in more complex um, class hierarchy. So there may be glue code between what we are optimizing and what the rest of the application is seeing. So that's, that's another um, side effect of that. Okay, so you don't expect the restrictions to cause any type of... Uh, issue for most scientific programmers and you also talked about how very early on Oreo doesn't force you to rewrite your entire application at what level do I kind of bolt my input parser code which I assume I'm not running through Oreo to code that's been run through Oreo is it at the function level and how do I define those so that the one can call the other and have all the symbols and everything match up yeah, exactly. So, a uh, very good point there. Uh, in some cases, it's really straightforward because you you know you have the same arrays going through both. Um, the so so the level first of all, um, it depends on um, what part of your code you're replacing. So, if you're replacing something that calls other functions with um, or your generated code, then then that code. Um, together with everything it calls, will not be executed anymore, right? Um, so that's, uh, so I can't say, oh no, it's just function level or loop level because it could end up replacing uh, larger portions of code. Uh, so the answer to that is um, you basically have to uh, decide, okay, here is the part of the code that should be optimized um, and express it in a language or you understand, and then that may uh, potentially replace a single loop or 
a collection of functions. So um, that's one aspect of it. Um, and then regarding the variables, um, if if you use the same, uh, so suppose you use the loop language um, and your input language is C um, or Fortran, um, there's a pretty straightforward mapping between your arrays and what the Oreo input is using. Uh, then it's all pretty much automatic. Now, if it's not a one-to-one -one match and you have to copy data structures around, then at the moment that's a manual uh, step, so you actually have to do that yourself, the gluing together of the generated code and uh, your existing application. Uh, although, so something I said earlier about integrating some more, um, some static analysis of the original code um, would help with that because we'll be able to at least um, uh, automate some of that mapping uh, by having parsed your actual uh, legacy implementation um, so, so that you don't have to manually convert data structures. Um, I'm not saying it's possible in all cases, but it may be possible in a lot of cases. So that's an interesting point you just brought up there, and it, it made me think, what is the most important metric that you are trying to optimize for? Is it, is it wall clock execution time? Um, at the moment, wall clock is the focus, although power is becoming uh, more and more interesting. Um, and so uh, we have uh, some initial, I'm not saying this is ready for prime time, but there have been some initial studies where we try to um, do uh, some multi-objective um, optimization uh, where you may consider both time and power. Uh, we just recently added... Um, measurement of uh, hardware counters to uh, this tuning process so that you could actually potentially define a completely different metric based on some other, um, based on those hardware counters that you may be interested. So maybe you want to minimize some cache misses or some derived quantities. So it will be possible at some point um, in the near future to be able to do that. But right now, uh, yes, wall clock time. Um, and um, limited power. So, okay. Now, uh, going off in a slightly different direction here. When I when I invoke Oreo, um, I, I have a bunch of code and I, I feed it in there. What kind of information does it give me? Does it say, "Oh, I took your function foo," and you know, I wasn't able to do anything, but I took bar, and boy, I optimized the heck out of that, and. Uh, everything underneath the bar or call tree has been replaced? Or what, what, what do you give back to the developer? Um, well, we, we may have some work to do there because I don't know if it's um, quite as uh, understandable <laughs> as you just described. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, so what we do is we take the input and then we just report, um, okay, here are the parameters we tried. And the parameters basically refer to the, the, what optimizations were applied. And uh, here's the time it took to run this version. And so we have a complete uh, list of uh, those options. We could also preserve all of these versions. Typically, we don't. Um, so, But you can ask it to keep them around. So you could look at um, everything it attempted to do. Um, but that, again, is not nearly as uh, readable as what you say. So maybe we should think about... Um, how do we actually explain the result <laughs> to the user as opposed to saying, here, this is the best use it, which is pretty much what you get now. Okay, so how let's, let's talk about the actual workflow. Um, that was a good example. but uh, So if I was sitting down and I was going to write a new application and I was planning on using Oreo, what what would I do? Like, what would be my steps and what would I, how would I iterate to actually get a working scientific application? Um, well, wait, did you say new, so that's a little bit different from our usual scenario, uh, but I suppose you could do the same kinds of things as you do for um, existing ones. Uh, you, you basically have some implementation and you uh, have uh, perhaps profiled it, um, so you're aware of certain parts of the implementation that are not performing as well as you want. Um, and then you um, have to decide, um, you know, which uh, typically if it's a C code um, you, you or Fortran, you have some set of loops that are uh, not doing as well as you think they should be. And then um, you can rewrite them um, and include uh, your 
um, or your input uh, specifying the same computation as a comment in the original, um, in the non oreo implementation, C or Fortran, for example. And uh, so that's part of the input you provide. And it's just a comment, so you can keep using your um, implementation completely separately from Oreo. You don't have to tie yourself to it. Um, and then in addition to that, you need a bit of extra input. Um, at the moment, you have to uh, generate, uh, in other words, write um, what we call a tuning spec. And inside of the tuning spec, you tell us a little bit more about that particular um, code region. Uh, uh, for example, what you want to try um, to optimize. Now, we're automating the generation of some of the tuning spec, for example, the types of transformations that should be um, allowed, but um, you can also write. Um, and so you need to learn a little bit about what Oreo can do um, to enumerate those options. And then you have to actually tell us a little bit more about um, the data. Um, so you have to uh, give uh, some information about, okay, what, what array sizes, for example, uh, should we optimize for? Because the, there are different types of optimizations um, based on the size of your data. Um, if it fits in L1 cache, uh, you'll get a different code from something that doesn't. And so uh, we need a description of the inputs that you want to optimize over. And uh, there's no way to get that out of your existing code. Um, and then uh, a little bit more about how you build it and, and all that, which you already have in your build system. Um, and that's about it. And that's the input to Oreo. And then you apply it uh, basically uh, the same way you do a preprocessor. So it looks like a compiler command line. Um, and you give it uh, your code, which has this comment um, that Oreo recognizes in it. And you give it a tuning spec, uh, which tells it what to do, what transformations to do, and what inputs to use. And then it goes off and does something for quite a while. Um, and ends up with uh, a new file uh, that you can now use instead of that um, original um, code fragment that you annotated with the Oreo comment. Now you made a glib comment right there at the end. You said it goes off, it does something for quite a while. Does, does the Oreo process take a while to do the searching and the benchmarking and the figuring out which one is best for this particular code and things like that? Uh, well, as, as, as with everything in life, there are trade-offs. <laughs> so um, if, you yeah. want, uh, if you want the optimal solution and, and guaranteed optimal, and it's, an, it's a non-trivial computation, right, not tiny, um, then that may not be feasible um, or you may have to pay a, a long wait. Um, uh, however, you can always limit the search. Uh, how long is it going to spend looking for the best version? You, you can enforce any limit you like and, and uh, not explore it exhaustively. Um, but then you're, of course, not guaranteed <laughs> that it's the optimal solution. Um, so, yeah, you, you, ha you get to decide how long it is you're willing to... Um, Search now, but keep in mind that you don't do this very often. I mean, you do it only, um, you would ever do it again only if you change your um, code semantics or um, if your underlying system changes. So, you mentioned earlier that, that Oreo is written in Python. Does that also imply that Oreo is open source? Uh, it definitely is. Um, and we've had some. Um, external contributors, I know not not many yet. I'm hoping for more. Um, so yes, and um, it will actually probably move very uh, soon to a more accessible site such as GitHub. Um, that's that's coming up very shortly, uh, so that it will be much easier for um, developers to jump in. And I've my unbiased opinion is it's pretty easy to pick up and and start adding to it. We do have. Uh, simple interfaces and some modules that are basically empty template types of module that you copy off um, and start doing your own thing. Um, and it's designed to be very dynamic in that you could um, add new functionality um, in a very uh, modular fashion so that you don't have to go and change a bunch of existing uh, 
code in the implementation in order to add your new functionality and test it. So um, it's not perfect, <laughs> but it, it's it's definitely a much lower bar to entry than um, a real um, compiler toolkit um, that's meant for production use. Now, you, you actually, <laughs> you've done this a lot in this <laughs> in our interview here. You touched on what I exactly want to ask about. Um, something that I frequently ask many uh, developer teams is, uh, what version control do you use and why? And this is actually interesting because this is the first time I've gotten it. That I'm looking on your, your web page today, which will probably change by the time this comes out, but I get a little view into the past, so to speak, and you're using Subversion. Uh, uh, but yes. you just mentioned GitHub. Uh, yeah, well, Subversion is better than CVS, right? And this has been oh, yes. in use for a few years, right? So, so uh, think of Subversion as being the next step um, after we uh, ditched CVS. Um, and um, the next step is something that's not, um, you know, so, so uh, I'm not really all that picky. So Git um, um, is definitely better than Subversion, in my opinion. For a multi-developer project, so that's kind of the next logical step. Okay, so since we're on the path of development here, um, what is kind of the future features that you want to work on and see in Oreo? Um, so one I already mentioned um, that's not directly Oreo is I want to make it even easier for people um, to use. So I'm not saying adding new languages necessarily or new transformations, but just for the users of what already exists. And what that means is uh, just automating uh, more of what people have to do manually right now. So definitely I want more automation in the tuning spec um, creation. Um, and also you, you brought that up, the output right now I think is not ideal for usability. So we're working on, on doing that. Uh, another aspect of making it um, much, much easier to use is uh, to actually enable, uh, couple it with other tools um, and enable us to identify which parts of your code uh, should be auto-tuned with Oreo. Uh, and so that's work in progress that, that is really exciting because we've been um, uh, we've been working with the Tau TAU group here at the University of Oregon to integrate more detailed measurement and collection of performance data, uh, which I think ultimately will let us automate uh, a lot more of the difficult part of the process, which is figuring out uh, you know exactly what part of your code you should be optimizing and how. Um, and then uh, from the research point of view, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, I want to keep thinking of uh, what new languages can we implement in this. Um, and then if people actually get interested in using it for production, um, we have to focus uh, on uh, correctness. Uh, we do validation right now, but I think you can prevent the need for some of it by doing more analysis during the transformations. So that's another uh, uh, future direction. And an ongoing uh, uh, effort uh, is always made to target um, architectures, um, different architectures. So I mentioned we do uh, code generations f for GPUs, for, uh, both with CUDA and OpenCL. Uh, but we still have a lot of ground to cover in the types of optimizations. Um, Intel Phi, um, we do this through OpenCL now, but um, again, you can do a lot more. And there's some initial work in FPGAs, um, which is really, really preliminary that I think um, may, may turn out to be quite uh, uh, useful um, in the long term too. Now, one thing we kind of forgot to ask you in the beginning, what, what is the license of your code? Um, it's a, a BSD style, open source. Um, the only requirement is to retain the copyright notice, um, and you can do pretty much uh, anything you want with it. And I've noticed that some people have done, um, you know, extensions or use it for some other purpose. Um, so it's completely open um, and... I don't believe uh, there are many restrictions that, that um, would prevent people from doing whatever they want with it. 
Is that the same with the generated code as well? Uh, I we have no uh, we have absolutely no claim on the generated code. It's, it belongs to whoever is running it. Um, so that is your code. Perfect. Um, so we we don't get it back. Uh, we don't see it. It would be nice if we could get it back, uh, but we would only do that with you know the owner's agreement. So. So what is one of the strangest um, or most unique uses of Oreo you've ever seen or unexpected? Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a couple of them that, that I think contend for first place. One was used uh, by someone uh, who was interested in basically being able to create uh, millions or billions of code variants to study uh uh, performance properties. He didn't care what the code was doing. It's just the ability to generate so many related code variants um, uh, that then they can analyze um, and basically develop um, machine learning approaches to studying. So that was interesting. Um, had nothing to do with code optimization per se. Um, and uh, the other one is we try, um, I mean, we are trying to optimize uh, some purely um, non-computational um, portions of a code, such as, you know, basically memory operations, copying and such uh, within MPI. So that is, uh, that is not the typical, um, you know, optimization target. Uh, but uh, again, there's some promising results there. So maybe... Uh, so maybe that's uh, something that we will focus on more in the future. Um, instead of focusing on basically flops, uh, we, could, we could also optimize memory operations. So users should be um, aware that this is a very aggressive um, optimizer. And um, if you think that um, O3 for conventional compilers um, is uh, pretty aggressive, then Oreo pursues uh, more like O300, and even though it does quite a bit of validation of the generated code, you should always be aware that um, some extra care needs to be taken to validate the final results of the computation once you um, use your optimized code. Okay, Boyana, thank you very much for your time. Uh, where can people find out and download uh, Oreo? So people can Google for Oreo, O-R-I-O, performance, uh, and that would take them to the Oreo webpage, which will have um, instructions on how to download and also direct to the people to the GitHub um, source repository where they can get the latest version or join us as developers. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time. This has been great. Well, thank you so much for having me.